Good evening and welcome to the Journey Home program. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Every week I have this wonderful privilege of introducing to you men and women who because of their love for Jesus Christ were brought home to the church. And everyone has a different story. And if you watch the Journey Home long enough, you see the unique fingerprints of God a little bit differently on every person as he by his grace draws them home. Our guest tonight is Dr. John Gresham. He's former Assembly of God member. He's professor at uh, Keswick Kenrick. Kenrick. Kenrick Glennon Seminary. I'm sorry, I got in that In the wrong. Archdiocese of St. Louis. All right, well, we talk about that in a little bit because that's uh, it's neat to hear uh, good messages about good seminaries. Uh, and in fact, in your case, under a wonderful Archbishop. Exactly. That's right. We're going to miss him. But let's uh, want to remind the audience that you are an essential part of the program. So if you'd like to give us a call, 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can call us at 205-271-2980, or you can send me an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. So let me officially welcome Thank you, you Thank to you. the Journey Home. Glad to be here. Dr. Gresham, it's great to have you here. We've Our paths crossed a little bit because you were at Steubenville for a while, right? Exactly, yeah. Just when I was leaving and moving on. As, but, as uh, you were moving out, I was <laughs> moving in. But you did mention, before I get into your journey, that you are going to miss your wonderful Archbishop. Oh, yeah. We, we, we love him, and he supported the Archbishop, Simi Burke, Archbishop Raymond Burke of St. Louis, formerly Archbishop of St. Louis, great supporter of the seminary, would come and take walks one-on-one -on -one with each seminarian, a real spiritual father to them, a great supporter of the seminary. And you'd said that one of his number one commitment was vocations. He said as a bishop, his prime responsibility is to provide priests to the parishes. And that means he was, uh, his priority was the seminary and vocations. And he promoted vocations at all ages, a great supporter of the seminary. Well, I'm sure if you went back yeah. 30 years in your life, you would never dream you'd be teaching at a Catholic I, seminary. I thought I would be teaching at an Assembly of God Bible College <laughs> by, right now. Well, let's, let me get out of the way and invite you to take a step back and give us a little summary of your spiritual journey. Well, my, my spiritual journey really took off in my teen years. I was raised Presbyterian, but when I was a teenager, 16 years old, my Baptist grandmother sent me a Soul Winner's New Testament. And I think this is a little New Testament with an outline of the gospel, and you would use this to win souls for Christ. The only soul I won was my own. I, I read through that uh, New Testament, and it presented in very plain language the good news of Jesus Christ, and really the same good news that's proclaimed in every Catholic Mass, that we're sinners in need of salvation through Christ who saves us through His death and resurrection and we're invited to receive Him. And so I prayed as a teenager and asked Christ to be my Lord, my Savior. The immediate change that took place in my life was a hunger. From that moment I had a hunger for God. And I think that hunger is part of what kept nudging me eventually to the Catholic Church. But at that time, the hunger led me to Scripture. I would read continuously that little King James New Testament over and over. I couldn't understand much of it, <laughs> but I read it and read it and would meditate. And also that hunger for God and just wanting more of God led me to the uh, charismatic renewal. I heard about this charismatic Bible study and uh, uh, went there and discovered the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the gift of praying in tongues. And uh, so I was this, this uh, high school Jesus freak, just in love with well, this Jesus. Is all high and, so yeah, this was in high school. Fire high school. And student. just full of the Holy Spirit and wanting to serve God. And I ended up eventually at Wheaton College. And when I got to Wheaton, I was looking for a good church to go to, spirit-filled church. Let me church. ask you that, though. Wheaton, I don't think of Wheaton usually as being charismatic. Right. Wheaton is more evangelical yeah. and, and all for the good for me. Yeah, right. Because I think with my charismatic kind of Jesus movement experience, uh, there was a strong anti-intellectual streak in my whole approach to, to the faith. It was all experience. Mm -hmm. In Wheaton, they had a slogan, Integration of Faith and Learning. 
and it, it's, uh, it, it echoes uh, a recent papal encyclical, Fetus et Ratio. <laughs> this Catholic idea of faith and reason working together really informs the education at Wheaton College, uh, though they have other roots for that in the Reformed tradition. And so I learned to love God with my mind at Wheaton College. But I ended up uh, with the Assemblies of God while I was at Wheaton. I found this great spirit-filled church, and I was going there week after week after week, and I found out it was Assembly of God. They didn't have Assembly of God in the name. It was just Calvary <laughs> Temple. But it was a great spirit-filled church, and the, and the thing I liked about the Assemblies of God was balance. A lot of charismatic churches and movements, they would just go all over the place, and it's easy to mistake our own inspirations for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And I thought the Assemblies of God had a good balance. They were really centered on Christ, and the, the baptism and gifts of the Holy Spirit were really gifts given to us to evangelize the world for Christ. And so there was a, a more balanced approach to the charismatic gifts I found there, and that kind of became my, my spiritual home. But the other thing that happened at Wheaton was there were some seeds planted there that would eventually bring me into the Catholic Church. At the time, they were not intended for that purpose whatsoever. Not at all. The first thing was I had a class in the Church Fathers, and it was a required class. Um, and I had a great professor, Dr. Robert Weber. He just passed away recently. And he really helped many, many evangelicals discover the Church Fathers. I never even heard of the Church Fathers. Right. My whole understanding was you had this movement of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And then you just have this darkness until not even, I skipped over Luther and Calvin. It wasn't until the 1900s with the Azusa, Azusa Street, Street revival and then the charismatic renewal and the Jesus movement, the Holy Spirit was moving. And so when I began to read the writings of the church fathers, I discovered that the Holy Spirit never abandoned his church. Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to the church, and he was there in the first century, the second century, the third century, the fourth century. And I discovered this on my own by actually reading the writings of these church fathers and, and finding these spirit-filled, Christ-loving, scripture quoting <laughs> uh, men of God. And so I began to see the Spirit at work through the church. And the other thing was reading, uh, learning about the early church councils. And I began to see tradition as the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. I thought before tradition was opposed to scripture, but as I saw how tradition, the Holy Spirit guiding the bishops of the church, meeting together in church councils, the Holy Spirit was guiding the church into a deeper understanding of Christ, a deeper understanding of the mystery of the Trinity. And so I began to see how he needed the help of the Holy Spirit as he worked through the fathers and the bishops of the church to help us understand these mysteries. And I began to understand tradition as the cumulative work of the Holy Spirit. And I found Protestants, we were always reinventing the wheel. We were always going back to the beginning and neglecting what the Holy Spirit had already taught us through history. The other thing I learned from the fathers was the significance of the incarnation. And Dr. Weber was particularly uh, adept at communicating this. As an evangelical, I was a very, and Pentecostal, I was a very strong believer in the incarnation. God had become flesh. God became man. In a very material way, God took human flesh, died a human death on the cross, rose bodily from the dead. So I was very strong in understanding how God made use of matter in bringing about salvation. And I held to that firmly. I mean, I would battle liberal Protestants to defend <laughs> all of those truths. But when it came to how we receive salvation, I became more Gnostic. It wasn't tangible. It wasn't visible. It wasn't sacramental. It was intellectual. You hear the message and you spiritually invite Jesus. But the fathers weren't that way. You were, just as God provided salvation in a material way, He imparts that salvation to us in a, in a material way, giving us new birth through the water of baptism, 
feeding us with the body and blood of Christ, taking bread and wine and making that into His body. And so I began to sense from the fathers a more sacramental understanding of salvation. So that happened to me at Wheaton. And the other thing that happened was I uh, moved, my parents moved from St. Louis to New Jersey. I'm originally from Texas. I think I still have a hint of an accent maybe. But they moved to New Jersey and I was in the summer between college and I was looking for one of these spirit-filled churches. There wasn't an Assembly of God church. There wasn't a Jesus Movement church. I, I asked people, I want one of those churches where they believe in the gifts of the Spirit and they praise the Lord. <laughs> and they said, oh yeah, there's, there's a group like that. They're called St. Francis Prayer Community. And uh, in the next town, I was in Sparta, New Jersey, and the next town over was this charismatic Catholic prayer community. And I went there, and the prayer meeting was, was pretty much what I was used to uh, in these other churches. But then I went to the Mass, and I, I literally fell in love with the Mass the first time I went. First of all, I said, they are worshiping like the church fathers did. Because I had studied these early accounts of worship in the days of the fathers, word and sacrament and the prayers. And here they were doing it. There were people still doing that. The Catholics <laughs> were doing that. And then I thought the Mass was so evangelical in the sense of the evangel is the gospel. And the Mass proclaims the gospel, not only in words, but in this whole dramatic representation of Jesus giving his body and blood. And then a real evangelical church, you know, you give an altar call. And sure enough, at this Catholic church, there was an altar call. They invited people forward to receive Jesus. I thought I was at a Billy Graham crusade, you know, <laughs> come forward and receive Jesus. But it was sacramental. It wasn't just in an interior way, in an emotional way, in an intellectual way. Receive his body and his blood. And then the clincher for me, before these Catholics received Jesus, they prayed this prayer. And they said, Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. And the first time I heard that prayer, I, I literally thought, I thought, well, wasn't this Luther's issue right here <laughs> that the Catholics are working to be saved? They don't recognize that salvation is a gift that we don't earn, that we don't deserve, that we receive. And, and I saw there's the gospel right there. There's justification. There's salvation by God's grace. Confessing our unworthiness and then asking again and again, receiving Christ and, and that, that ongoing conversion through Christ. And so, so those seeds were planted, and my story's kind of like the seed that was planted and grew underground. So this was a, a, quite a ways before you yeah. really thought about it. I never thought of becoming Catholic. I just thought, I really thought, I'd like to bring some of this to the Assemblies yeah. of God. <laughs> some of this, the church fathers and creeds, and, and that just never worked out real well. And that <laughs> And a lot of people have tried, yeah. you know, and try and pull yeah. some of the Catholic things in. Obviously, you'll see, even when I was a Presbyterian, I was seeing more and more of liturgical robes and liturgical things yeah. that, that they didn't invent. I mean, they're, they're really reaching back to what they call the traditional church, not, not yeah. recognizing that it's really Catholicism that they're going back to. Yeah. Now, your professor that was teaching you the early church fathers, I'm curious on how he taught them. Well, he was an evangelical Episcopalian. All right. So, so, so as an Episcopalian, this was the early church. Oh, yeah. Parallel with the yeah. Catholic and, and he really uh, opened the eyes of many evangelicals to the contributions of the church fathers hmm. and the uh, beauty of liturgical worship. And so through his influence, many evangelicals became Episcopalian, eventually including <laughs> myself. Those seeds uh, and wanting, wanting more tradition, uh, eventually led together, my wife and I, out of the Assemblies of God into the Episcopal Church. And, and I have to say, another part of that was raising children. Mm -hmm. My children, they don't know this, but they helped me become Catholic. <laughs> As we were raising these children, one thing I began to understand infant baptism in a new light. 
That was one of my, one reason I was still assembly of God. I believed in adult believers baptism. But here I was raising Christians in my home. They were growing up from their first breath in the Christian faith, growing up knowing Jesus, loving Jesus. And I thought the whole approach of a believer's baptism was like I'm raising these little pagans and one day they acted like pagans at times but uh, you know these little pagans someday will decide to become Christians and it wasn't that at all they were being raised in the faith and then I, I read an article talking about infant baptism as household baptism and, and that connected it to the scriptures for me a whole household was baptized we see several references to that in scripture and I began to understand a new light that this is a believing family bringing their children into the family of God through the water and the new birth of baptism with the responsibility to raise them in the faith. I'm curious there in the baptism issue, you look back to your Wheaton days when you were trained as an evangelical, I can't remember myself, that's what I'm wondering. Were they making the direct connect between circumcision in the Old Testament and baptism in the New? Well, I think the interesting thing at Wheaton is you had all different views. Sure, okay. Because it was an evangelical yeah. interdenominational like school. Yeah. And so some from the more Presbyterian side would talk about that link with circumcision and, and emphasizing the, um, the, the family connection. Right. Um, the believer's baptism would emphasize a circumcision of heart prior to I okay. baptism. Right. And so okay. so I, I, wanted, I began to want my children to have baptism. It seemed to make more sense. Mm. And also in raising my children, we became more and more traditional. We discovered Advent. Okay. I wanted my children to know what Christmas was about. And at first, we weren't going to have any Santa Claus stuff in our house, but my youngest child, who's now 26, <laughs> we, she was just learning to talk, and she would say, Mama, Dada, and we walked in a store, and she said, Santa Claus. And I looked at my <laughs> wife, and I said, did you teach her that? And she looked at me. I didn't teach her that. So we decided, well, we'll do Santa Claus. It's fun. But we want our children to know Christmas is really about Jesus. And we discovered the Advent wreath. And we began to discover the Christian year. And so let's help our children pre prepare for Christmas by observing Advent. And then we found out there's a thing called Lent to prepare for Easter. <laughs> and so in our family practices, we really unknowingly, we were becoming more and more Catholic and wanting that. And then in my studies, by then I was doing a doctorate in religious studies at Baylor University. And I was really studying, studying modern Christian thought, 19th and 20th century theology. The more I studied modern theology, the more I wanted to go back to the fathers. And I saw the importance of tradition in transmitting the mystery of Christ and the hazards of neglecting and discarding that tradition. And, and the clincher for me was to see the importance of apostolic succession. That this tradition is not just ideas that we grab from the past, but tradition is the church handing on her own life to each succeeding generation. And just like that incarnational principle and that sacramental principle, there's an ecclesiological principle that this, this tradition is embodied in a succession of teachers who were charismatically gifted with the, with the charism of truth. And so uh, together, my wife and I said, we want to be under bishops. We want to worship liturgically. We want to feel connected. And so we became Episcopalian. Um, the Catholic still wasn't on the charge. That though. wasn't there. That <laughs> wasn't there. But it, almost as soon as I became Episcopalian, I started thinking about the Catholic Church. And it was like this for me. Once I accepted apostolic succession, that the ministry of the bishops, I mean the ministry of the apostles mm -hmm. at the church's beginning was transmitted through their successors, the bishops, I had to ask about Peter because you have these promises to the apostles but you have also have these promises to Peter and I knew something of the Bishop of Rome and his role in those early church controversies hmm. and, and a, a passage that struck me really it's not usually the passage that kind of helps people grasp Petrine mission of the Bishop of Rome but it was uh, 1 Corinthians 15 
St. Paul is handing on a creed. He says, I'm handing on to you what I received. Uh, and he's writing this in the 50s. Yeah. And the New Testament is not even written yet. And St. Paul is quoting a creed of the early church that he was given by the church in Jerusalem. And he hands this creed on that Christ died, he was risen according to the scriptures. And that whole little mm -hmm. creed you have there in 1 Corinthians 15. And the witnesses are Cephas and the Twelve. Peter, using his Aramaic name, so it suggests this creed is quite old. Mm -hmm. Cephas and the Twelve. And so I began to see even in this early Christian creed that we have preserved for us in the New Testament that it's Peter and the Twelve. And so I, I would say I was almost haunted by the question of, of the Catholic Church. And, and just in my studies and my reading of Scripture, experiences that I had, uh, we lost a child at that time. And our daughter Leah died at birth. And one of the things that comforted us so much in the Episcopal Church, we would pray for our dead. The Episcopalians, they don't believe in purgatory, but they pray for the dead. You almost have to be Episcopalian to figure that out. <laughs> but I, I can't figure it out now. But uh, it comforted us so much praying for our daughter who had died. And I had a good friend, because this was about the time we had left the Assemblies of God. He was an Assembly of God youth minister. Mm -hmm. And they lost a child. And we got together for dinner to sort of cry on each other's shoulders. And he said, he said, what are you doing? Like, how are you, how are you dealing with this loss? And I was kind of scared to tell him. He might, might grab his King James Bible. And, and I said, well, what's really helping me is praying, praying for our, our lost child that died. That, you know, we lost her, but she's with God in heaven. And he looked at me. And he said, I'm doing the same thing. I pray for my little child that died. <laughs> and as an example, how Catholicism, not only is it really the fulfillment of, of what's authentic in, in Protestantism and even in Pentecostalism, mm -hmm. what's authentic there is fulfilled in the Catholic fullness of faith. Mm -hmm. But what's authentic in our human hearts our love for our dearly departed, that finds its fulfillment in the Catholic faith. I had another experience. I, as I finished my PhD, I couldn't get a teaching job and I worked as a librarian. And so I've been a librarian, I've been a professor, and I'm very happy now to teach full time. And I was on a, at a library conference and I took a break from the conference. It was in San Antonio, I was still in Texas then. And uh, I took a break from the conference and walked into this Catholic church to pray. I was Episcopalian then, so I was used to the kind of environment. <laughs> and I felt the presence of God there in that church. And I knew about the Catholic teaching about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. I didn't really know that the presence of Christ is there in the tabernacle, hmm. that, that consecrated bread that has become the body of Christ. But I felt, I really felt the presence of Christ who was there in the tabernacle. And I was praying and have, it was just this profound sense of God's presence. And then a fellow came into the church to practice the organ. And all of a sudden I had a soundtrack from my <laughs> spiritual experience. <laughs> it just couldn't have been more perfect. And so from time to time, the thought would come to me, I should look at the Catholic Church. The Episcopal Church is not far enough. And I would mention it to my wife. I'd say, I'm thinking about the Catholic Church. And she would say, well, you just changed jobs. That's enough change. Or we just got pregnant. That's enough change. <laughs> and there's always change going on in our life. And we'd say, that's enough change. And, and I wasn't sure about it. And I would kind of put it back on the shelf. And I might read something. You know, I, would, I was still doing my theological research. And I discovered this journal, Communio. And I was always looking for modern examples of what I found in the Church Fathers. And I was reading this Catholic journal, Communio, and it had articles in there by people like Hans Urs von Balthasar and this fellow named uh, Joseph Ratzinger. <laughs> and I thought, they're, they're doing theology today like the Church Fathers did. It's integrated. It's done in communion with the Church and with tradition. It's highly academically rigorous, and yet feeding the soul 
in bringing one before the mystery of Christ. And, and things like that would happen. And I would, I would visit a Catholic church when I was working as a librarian at Baylor. I would go over uh, to the nearby Catholic church and sit in on Mass. And I'd tell it again to my wife, maybe we should look in a Catholic church. And by then we were going to move to Kansas where I was going to be a library director. No, there's too much change going on. Okay. <laughs> but the question would not go away. And, and my wife, Mary Jane, I said, I said, I have to answer this question. I'm not saying I'm going to become Catholic, but I have to really look at the question. I want to start going to the Catholic Mass. I want to get instruction in the Catholic faith. The other thing, by that time, the catechism had come out. And I read that, <laughs> and the pieces were all fitting together. And I could see how it was all there. And she said, if you're going to look into the Catholic Church, I'll do it with you. And I, I love her so much for that. So we, we never heard of RCIA. My knowledge of Catholicism was, was very bookish. In fact, I was thinking even last week that we need to say it's the uh, uh, right of Christian right, yeah. initiation for adults, because obviously RCIA yeah, and a lot of our non-Catholic doesn't audience yeah. doesn't include this what we're talking year, about. This year-long formation in the faith of coming into the Catholic faith. And, and it was a beautiful experience. And there wasn't even a Catholic church in our little town where this college was in Kansas. And we had to drive over to the next town to go to RCIA. And so we'd talk about it driving home. And we'd be driving home and Mary Jane said, you know what, we're already more Catholic than we are Episcopalian. <laughs> and she just, just warmed right up to it. And, and we started in not knowing that we would be Catholic at the end, but we just, we just, it, discovered more and more of the truth of the faith mm -hmm. and entering just through that whole RCI process. It was beautiful. And by the time we got to the, to the Easter Vigil, we were ready. Uh, the biggest, uh, I think the hard part was going, making my first confession at age 39. <laughs> I had a pretty long list, but I was a real gentleman. We were in line for confession. I said, Mary Jane, you go first. <laughs> but uh, now I, I love the sacrament of confession. It's a real encounter with Christ. The priest is just a voice for Christ to speak Christ's forgiveness to us. And, and I will say too, when I got to the very end, we were at the Easter Vigil and I kind of got cold feet. I mean, here I was, we were coming into the church and I thought, what am I doing? Because so long I had thought of Catholicism sort of theoretically I, I, and I was already practicing a lot of what the church taught and adopting a lot of Catholic teaching, uh, but it was very intellectual. But Catholicism is not just the intellect. It's really stepping into and becoming joined to this family of faith and to this, this community. And, and it was taking that step. I've had that feeling twice in my life. The first time I had it was right before I got married. <laughs> I said, what am I doing? This is a real commitment. And who knows, we might even have children. <laughs> uh, that's a responsibility. But I loved Mary Jane. I said, yeah, I'm ready. And I said, I love Christ. And I find more of Christ. The Catholic Church brings me into a deeper union with Christ. It was, it was just in continuity with that prayer I prayed as a 16-year-old. I want Christ. I want to give myself to Christ. And I remember there before the vigil, and they had two statues there of St. Rita and St. Teresa. The church was St. Teresa's. And, and I never paid much attention to them, but as I looked to them at that moment, they, they just sort of looked like they were welcoming me. <laughs> Come on in. It's all right. And uh, so we came into the church. If I could add one more story. Yeah. I don't know how we're doing on time. Well, Marcus, after you, the story, we'll take okay. a break. That's great. When we were in RCIA, uh, we ha went to lunch with a Presbyterian minister that we were friends with, and we started talking about the Catholic Church. And he said, you sound like this guy I went to seminary with. I do? He says, yeah, I went to seminary with this guy, and this guy was really anti-Catholic. And after he left the seminary, he became Catholic. It's this guy named Scott Hahn. I said, you went to seminary with Scott Hahn? He says, yeah, I have his tapes. You want to listen to him? And by then, he had Kimberly's tapes. And so um, he gave us these tapes. And, and it encouraged me so much because I could find so many uh, commonalities with his journey. And just to find another person 
uh, with the same evangelical background to travel this path and to say, maybe I'm not crazy. Maybe I'm not the only one that <laughs> others have traveled this same road. Well, after the show, you're going to have to tell me this Presbyterian's name because if he was Scott Hahn's classmate, then he was also oh, mine. Okay. <laughs> I'd like okay. to know who he was. I'll have to pull that out of yeah, these like uh, figure that out. old right. brain cells. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gresham. Let's take a break. We'll come back just a moment with your questions for Dr. Gresham. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest for this episode is Dr. John Gresham, and thank you, John, for sharing a, your journey. And uh, I hope the audience uh, picked up on this, but you and your wife came in together. We did. It's not always the we case. We did. We did. And that, yeah. that's a real blessing. We, um, when we started RCA, we weren't sure we'd be Catholic at the end, so we didn't really include our children in that process. And so, Interestingly enough, after listening to Scott Hahn's tapes, he became my neighbor and my colleague because we moved to Steubenville. That's right. <laughs> and uh, I was working there as a librarian and also teaching theology part time. And so our kids came into the church there at Steubenville, and each each child had their own personal catechist, a Steubenville trained catechetic student to to catechize my children and. Uh, I, I got to touch base with one of those uh, young people here at EWTN today. It doesn't get much better than that, yeah. the students there. All right, excellent. Let's see. We've got a couple emails and phone calls. Let's take this email first. It comes from Mary from New York. She writes, Dear uh, Dr. Gresham, the Assemblies of God that I have been familiar with put great value on being filled with the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in tongues. What is your view of that belief and practice now? Thank you, Mary, for the email. Yeah, this is, this is what they call one of their distinctives, that the evidence, uh, the initial physical evidence of the baptism in the Spirit is speaking in tongues. Um, that's one of the things that's helped me as a Catholic to really have a much broader understanding of spiritual gifts and charisms. And I recently had the opportunity to teach on charisms at a Catholic charismatic conference in St. Louis. And to bring not only scripture, but the teaching of the church fathers yeah. and the catechism. And one of the things in the Catholic understanding is we have extraordinary charism, speaking in tongues, healing, miracles, all of which the Catholic Church embraces. But we also have ordinary charisms, giving, serving, yeah. works of mercy, teaching. And it's up to the Holy Spirit to, and this is right out of scripture, the Spirit gives the gifts according as He wills. And so, I th in the Catholic understanding, there's a real openness to the whole range of charismatic gifts. So, uh, for me, I, I hold on to uh, much of what I experienced and learned in the charismatic renewal and the Assemblies of God, but with a, with a bit broader perspective, yeah. encouraging everyone uh, to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, which is given to us in baptism and confirmation, but needs to be released in our lives through faith. And we need to open ourselves to His gifts. Uh, you find charisms mentioned numerous times in the Vatican II documents, mm -hmm. most often in relation to the laity. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so I find a lot of what the teaching uh, that I found in the Assemblies of God there in the Catholic Church, but without insisting that everyone needs to have this particular gift or that. For those of you that are interested to learn more about that from a Catholic perspective, uh, one author that, that uh, Dr. Gresham and I were mentioning during the break is uh, Father Cantela Mesa. It's wonderful books, all of which are very balanced. Father Cantela Mesa is still the preacher to the papal household. Exactly, yeah. And uh, 
I, any in Assembly of God folk watching, I think you could read uh, uh, Conte La Mesa's books, and as we used to say, he would bless your socks right off. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's take our first caller. This is Fran from Missouri. Hello, what's your question for us? Hi. Um, my husband is a recent convert to the Catholic Church. I'm a cradle Catholic, right. and he was just recently received at the Easter Vigil at St. Patrick's in Rolla, Missouri. And uh -huh. he was raised Great. Assembly of God and has been, had been going to a non-denominational Christian church. He's having some struggles with getting over like past beliefs and also with uh, having to defend uh, challenges from other people about his decision to become Catholic. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could comment on that. All so right. I'll hang up now and listen to the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Fran, for that. Well, her husband went through some of the same steps you did and is fighting some of the battles. I think one thing, on, on the one question of how to defend his Catholic faith to his former uh, friends in the Assemblies of God and, and charismatic churches, to let them know that he still loves Jesus and that other people in the Catholic Church really love Jesus and to, to share how what the Catholic Church provides for him in the Eucharist, in confession, in some of our devotional practices, how that's making him a, a better spirit-filled Christian, that he's growing closer to Christ. I think giving, giving that witness. And, and the other thing is just to keep, keep studying the faith, keep reading the catechism. There's so many great resources uh, online and to, to keep studying the faith. Uh, I don't know if that can help much more than that. I think I noticed your website's got a lot of links on it, right? I have a, uh, I don't think that's a, is that available? Sure, go ahead. I have a, I have sure. a website, um, www.kenrickparish.com slash Gresham that will link you to a number of good uh, Catholic resources, apologetics websites, uh, Catholic blogs, Catholic magazines, uh, all kinds of resources. Yeah, that's amazing. Good stuff out there. All right, thank you. Let's take our next, um, let's see, was that a phone call we just did? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, take our next email. This goes from Jack. He writes, Dear Dr. Gresham, are Protestant charismatics similar to Catholic charismatics? Is this an area where authentic ecumenical dialogue might be possible? Don't Catholics consider the sacrament of confirmation to be equivalent to the Assemblies of God idea of, quote, baptism in the Holy Spirit, end quote? Thanks, Jack. Well, there's, that's a great place for, for dialogue. I think there's been two areas that amazing progress has taken place uh, between Catholics and Protestants. One is in the pro-life movement, working together with evangelicals for pro-life, and the other one is in the charismatic renewal. Catholics and Protestants both rediscovering these gifts of the Holy Spirit, particularly the extraordinary gifts, and becoming aware of the supernatural power of God in our lives. And so there is a lot of common ground there. But the, the heart of the difference would be our sacramentalism, that we would see in confirmation this empowering and gifting of the Holy Spirit. But with, with our uh, Assembly of God brothers and sisters, we would also agree with them that, that that's something to be experienced, to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, to be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, each, each Mass, not only we, are we afresh receiving the body and blood of Christ, this is, this is a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit who comes to us through the death and resurrection of Christ. And I think we, we, we often forget that. Mm. And so we should, we should come out of Mass uh, with our baptism renewed by being united again to Christ in His death and resurrection, but also our confirmation renewed by receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit in each Mass. Isn't one of the dangers always that in, it's true of Catholicism, it's also true of Episcopalianism and other Christian traditions that have a very external aspect of the faith that pretty soon the external aspect can become mere ritual. It's the danger of that. Exactly. So the Catholics, we, you know, we, we, we dip our fingers in the holy water yeah. and in time we just do that because we do that and forget that we're really 
re-experiencing baptism or experiencing yeah. renewal of that baptism when, in every aspect of our... When I went through RCIA, something I never forgot, because in our RCIA, different people would give testimonies, and they'd always start their testimony, I'm a convert, or they'd say, I'm a revert, or I'm a cradle Catholic. I'm, yeah. it, but when they said, I'm not a convert, I'm a cradle Catholic, the priest of our parish, he said, if you're not a convert, you're not a Catholic. <laughs> every Catholic is a convert. Right. Every Catholic is called to conversion. And so even though you receive that baptism as a child, that baptism is a lifelong call to conversion. Yep. Very good. Let's take our next caller, Joe from New York. What's your question for us tonight, Joe? Hi, Marcus. Uh, it's a very interesting show. I, I enjoy your show tremendously. Thanks. My question is for Dr. Gresham. And what I was wondering is, did Blessed Virgin Mother or one of the saints bring you back to the church? And who, who was your favorite saint? Thank you, Joe. Oh, wow. <laughs> the Blessed Virgin Mary was an obstacle. Yeah. That was sort of the last uh, <laughs> obstacle <laughs> to coming into the church. I just didn't get it. I just didn't get it. I didn't quite grasp uh, the Catholic teaching. But here's how I got over that. I said the Catholic Church is right about the Trinity, about the two natures of Christ, the one person of Christ, about the real presence of, uh, of Christ in the Eucharist, about the canon of Scripture, about all these moral issues, pro-life, and on and on and on. I said if the Church is right about every one of those issues, the Church is probably right about Mary as well. <laughs> and I think the problem was is I had a personal relationship with Christ and I never had a personal relationship to Mary. And the thing that helped me was understanding the Gospel of John, Jesus giving Mary to us from the cross as our mother and, and taking her as a mother who helps me know Christ and, and beginning to pray the rosary as a, as a prayer that is not so much praying to Mary as praying with Mary and meditating on these events in the life of her son. The, the rosary has helped me so much to know Christ and to enter into the mysteries of his life and his death and his resurrection. And I see Mary helping me to do that. And so it was really after becoming Catholic and praying the rosary that I began to get to know Mary. My, my favorite saint is really not a saint, it's a blessed. It's Blessed Mary Teresa of St. Joseph who founded the Carmelites of the Divine Heart of Jesus. And I had the opportunity in St. Louis of teaching their novices and their postulants. Mm -hmm. And she was a convert. And so I felt very close to her, reading her <laughs> life and teaching her, her daughters, so to speak. And just recently she was declared blessed and her feast day is October 30th which is my birthday. <laughs> and her feast day is actually the date of her conversion of coming into the Catholic Church. Wow. And so she, she is, is my patron um, and, my, and my favorite. And, and we pray someday to be uh, declared a saint by the Catholic Church. Because the other reason that that's a barrier, Mary and the saints, is that as an assembly of God or other even juggle, especially a Wheaton, the idea of praying the communion of saints is yeah. a completely different yeah. concept. Yeah, and you know what, what really helped me with that was understanding the unity of the body of Christ. And I had to ask myself, we're all one body. We're members of one another. We suffer with one another. We help one another. We're called to bear one another's burdens, to pray for one another. And I said, can death divide the body of Christ? I had to ask myself that question. If I can ask you to pray for me, why can't I ask Maria Teresa of St. Joseph, you know, why can't I ask her to pray for me? As death broken or divided, nothing can separate us from Christ. And if we're united with Christ, nothing can separate us from one another. And so it's really there, the, the unity of the body of Christ that helped me see this whole idea that it, it goes beyond even the veil of death, that we're still one body helping one another to heaven by our intercessions. Another email, Bill from Wisconsin. Dear Dr. Gresham, it seems clear from your witness that the charismatic aspects of Catholic worship are powerful precisely because they're informed by the liturgy and rooted in the tradition of the church. How can the church convey this fact to Pentecostals? And how can more Catholics 
be made aware of the gifts of the Spirit as they plainly exist within the authority and sacraments of the church. I wish I knew. <laughs> I, I, again, I think with, with, with our Pentecostal brothers and sisters to let them know, to be a witness to them of our love for Jesus, of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I think within the Catholic Church too, um, each of us, we need to share not only with, with Protestant brothers and sisters, but with our Catholics uh, brothers and sisters. Um, for many of them, the, the gifts given to them in the sacraments are untapped. Yeah. Uh, they yeah, need many, to hear. For many, they, confirmation they, is like a, just a rite of passage. Right, and they yeah. need to hear. Yeah. They need to hear that challenge, yeah. and and there I think the the charismatic renewal is a gift to the church, to uh, help many discover the the vibrancy and the life of the Holy Spirit, and not only the charismatic renewal. There's many movements in the church, and they're yeah. all charismatic. They're all charisms, gifts of the Spirit to the church, and I think the the movements in general is a way to uh, help uh, other Catholics to yeah, their place in the church. be evangelized. Yeah. They've been sacramentalized. Some of us still need to be evangelized. Yeah, John Paul emphasized that so much exactly. in the evangelization. This is what's taught by our, our, the Holy Father, John Paul II, and now Pope Benedict, the same message. You know, I was thinking that, you know, uh, a recognition of the reality of the Holy Spirit in our lives is not a a movement away from appreciation of God the Father or God the Son, but but being authentically Trinitarian. Oh yeah, yeah. Because sadly, too often, not just Catholics but Christians in their everyday spiritual lives can be very low on the Holy Spirit and higher. Yeah, on. and there and there's a very traditional Catholic way to get to know the Holy Spirit, and that's to pray, "Come Holy Spirit." We have this traditional Catholic prayer to the Holy Spirit. And John Paul II, in one of his uh, autobiographical writings, he said when he was young, his father taught him that prayer. Hmm. And he said from that moment on, daily he would pray, Come Holy Spirit. Hmm. And look where it got him. <laughs> he went from a little boy in Poland praying, Come Holy Spirit, to this wonderful pope that we had for so many years. All right, let's go to uh, Michael from New Jersey. What's your question for us? Yeah, um, I live in South Jersey where there are dozens and dozens of Assemblies of God churches and the vast majority of their members are ex-Catholics. Can you tell me what the attraction is, why they've been so successful in evangelizing us? And also, when I've had conversations with Assemblies of God members, they tell me, I'm not really saved, I don't have Jesus. Now, how would you answer people who argue with you like that, right. that just dismiss you? Michael, thank you for your question. Yeah. First of all, I, I have to say at one point I wondered, uh, there were so many Catholics coming over to the Pentecostals and here I was, this lonely Pentecostal coming over to the Catholics. I had to wonder, um, <laughs> you know, who, who was going the right way on this one-way street? And, um, but many, many Pentecostals are discovering the riches of the, of the Catholic faith. Uh, and I think it's not so much a matter of, of uh, a lack uh, or, or some flaw in Pentecostalism, but it's discovering that there's more, that the Holy Spirit didn't just start moving at Azusa Street in the early 1900s, but discovering the work of the Holy Spirit down through the centuries. And I think, I think Assemblies of God have had success in, in evangelizing Catholics because of our failure, um, a failure in our catechesis, not catechizing our own and helping them understand that we have all these riches of faith and spirit and blessings and charisms within the Catholic Church. Uh, sometimes a failure of catechesis, sometimes um, uh, a failure in, in homiletics, uh, not, not calling the Catholic people to that real conversion of heart, uh, responding to the grace of the sacraments from their heart. But, but the one part of Assemblies of God telling you you don't know Jesus, you just have to tell them you do. You love Jesus. You're living for Him. He's working in your life. If you could tell them stories about what Christ has done in your life, how He's transformed your life, that's what they need to hear. And uh, they're open to that because they're, they're experiential. 
<laughs> they, they experience a new birth. They experience a baptism in the Spirit. And they understand that. They don't understand our sacraments. But if we share our experience, they'll understand that. Mm. And they'll recognize us as brothers and sisters, even as we recognize them as brothers and sisters. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Another email, Steve from Illinois. Good evening, Dr. Gresham. How do you explain to an Episcopalian who claims they believe in the real presence that they are not able to partake of Catholic communion? I find this disheartens many Episcopalians and keeps them from coming home. God bless. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a tough question. When we were bringing our children into the church, and I was trying to explain to my children the difference between the Episcopal Church and the Catholic Church, and we had already been raising them very Anglo-Catholic. <laughs> and uh, um, I'm this odd mix as an Episcopalian. I was this charismatic Anglo-Catholic Episcopalian, and I'm still a pretty <laughs> odd Catholic, I guess, this Pentecostal Catholic seminary professor. But I, I told my children, I said, well, in the Catholic Church, they believe it's the real presence of Christ. And they said, we've always believed that. That's what you always taught us. I said, yeah, but in the Catholic Church, they really believe it. And, and the only way I could communicate it to them is I said, watch the people at church. Watch the people genuflect as they head to the pew. Why are they genuflecting? Because they recognize the presence of Christ there. And in the Episcopal Church, it was almost an option. I mean, you can believe in the real presence if you want to, <laughs> or you can believe it's symbolic if you want to. Whereas in the Catholic Church, it's dogmatically taught. And so for me, even experientially, there was quite a difference um, from, from uh, the, the Eucharistic type worship in the Episcopal Church and, and really the reality that I found as, as a Catholic. Um, but, but I would say be, be very prayerful and, and patient because the folk in the Episcopal Church are going through great trials right now. Yeah. And, and we really just want to hold out a hand to them and say, consider the Catholic Church. The, the Catholic Church is the answer to the problems that they are facing uh, as a community. Hmm. Let's say that we've got a few folk watching right tonight that are presently at where you were before you came into the church. How about a word or two why they ought to consider making the same journey home that you've made? I would say several things. Coming into the Catholic Church is bringing to fulfillment whatever is authentic in your Protestant tradition. It's coming to know Christ in His fullness. It's coming to receive the Spirit and His gifts in its fullness. I would encourage people to read the Catechism. It is so biblical. It is, so, it is a Spirit-filled book. And they will see truth there. And, and those that are really seeking, I would encourage them to visit a Catholic church, sit before the tabernacle, this little box we have in the Catholic church, and there's this consecrated bread that we believe has become the body of Christ, that He's present there to speak to you. And, and to go and, and just talk to Jesus and say, are you calling me to the Catholic church? Is this my home? And, and let Jesus talk to your heart. God, a little bit more time. I'd love you to say another fine word about the seminary that you teach at. I'll say several words. <laughs> no seminary is without its problems. And we have a big problem. We have too many seminarians. <laughs> we have too many seminarians, and we're building. We're adding rooms. And um, I would say if you want to support us? <laughs> Bill, can I do that? <laughs> after you write your check to EWTN, after you write your check to the Coming Home Network, if you have any left over, especially if you appreciate Archbishop Burke and what he's done for the church and you want to honor him, if you want to send a little to well, our seminary for our building campaign, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, we tried to make a Journey Home uh, an infomercial. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry. But the, but the real point is that it is good to know that there is really a strong and growing and faithful seminary. I mean, that's great it's, to know. It's beautiful, very loyal to the church, young men coming, older men coming that love Christ, that are loyal to the church, that are generous and faithful and wanting to give of themselves to the church. And 
uh, Archbishop Burke, our former vocation director, Father Butler, many people really made that happen, and the work of the Holy Spirit, of course. All right. Well, Dr. Gresham, thank you very much for joining us on the journey home and sharing your journey. Also, for your, what you're doing, your continued thank teaching you. and your internet work that you're doing, it's, it's excellent. So, thank you for your witness to us and your encouragement. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I think Dr. Gresham's been a wonderful challenge to all of us, really to be fully Trinitarian, to make sure that we, rec we recognize the full gifts that God has given to us in the sacraments, not just for us, so that we're empowered to imitate Christ and to share Him with those in our lives. God bless you. See you next week.